Alliance for Citizens presentation. Uh, for those of you who have not joined us before, welcome. My name is Tom Miller. I have the honor and privilege of being the sixth director here at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Sciences Chesapeake Biological Lab. Um, we have been here in Solomons, Maryland for 95 years. And uh, over that time, we have been supported by our local community. And over those same 95 years, we've continued to conduct the science that we need for the environment that we want. Uh, about nine or 10 years ago, uh, we committed to reconnecting with the local community and started hosting Science for Citizens presentations as a free public lecture, five in the spring and five in the autumn. We also committed to having an open house every September where we showcased our work and we welcomed people of all ages from throughout the Southern Maryland area into our laboratories. Unfortunately, with the ongoing health pandemic, uh, neither the open house nor the normal Science for Citizens were possible this year. But we decided to look at this as an opportunity and a challenge um, rather than a pro pro problem. And so we have uh, decided to launch a virtual science semester um, that tries to bring together both of our open house and our science for citizens presentations. Um, that virtual open house is available to you on the web. Um, I'm going to briefly share my screen so that you can uh, see uh, a little bit about it. It's available at our website, umsees.edu forward slash CBL forward slash science semester. But if you can't remember any of that, go to umsees.edu, just type in virtual science semester in the search box, and it will bring you to this page. And you will see on this page, we have the Science for Citizens presentations. We now have videos about life behind the scenes at CBL. Um, very shortly, we'll have student interviews, alumni interviews, and science at home, which are uh, projects designed for middle school students um, to try and engage them in STEM and STEM careers. Uh, our Science for Citizens program has been ongoing now for a decade. And you'll find that there are 55 recorded videos um, under the Science for Citizens tab that you can access. Some of the video quality may not be as high as we would wish, but I can assure you that the science quality is of the extreme highest st standard. Um, Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the third of our Science for Citizens presentations. These presentations are sponsored, as they have been for the last few years, by PNC Bank and by Southern Maryland Toyota and Team Hyundai. Normally, they pay for tea, coffee, and refreshments for the attendees. Uh, but now, in this new world, they're paying for advertising and for, for getting the word out about these programs. So we thank our sponsors for their continued support. Um, tonight, it is a real pleasure to welcome one of our own in every sense of the word. Uh, Ryan Woodland came to us to do his master's degree with our colleague Dave Secor, which he completed in 2005 on Atlantic Sturgeon. Um, he liked the experience so much, he stayed for a PhD, but shifted his focus to coastal fisheries and looked at fish communities in the, sh the shallow coastal ocean in the vicinity of Ocean C C C City. Um, and then Ryan developed a little bit of a wanderlust. And, and he left uh, southern Maryland, moved to Quebec, uh, where he worked at the uh, University du Québec at Trois-Rivières with a former colleague of mine, Gilbert Cabana, looking at um, fish community structure, this time in freshwater reaches of the St. Lawrence and lakes around there. Um, he then moved to the University of Monash in Australia uh, 
Sadly, I don't have a colleague that I know there and can go and vi vi visit, uh, but Ryan did some groundbreaking work while there um, where he used stable isotopes to infer um, the patterns of nutrient lo loading or the implications of nutrient loading in lakes and e estuaries in Australia. We were lucky enough to recruit him back to CBL in 2015 and in the five years he's been with us he's developed a really strong program looking at interactions in the, at the base of the food web in the Chesapeake Bay. And he's also been one of three faculty that has led a series of cruises onto the Patuxent River. And this was part of uh, a commitment I made um, when I first became director to try and, and retake the river and own the river once again from a scientific point of view as, as we once did. And so Ryan's going to talk a little bit about our research on the Patuxent River to uh, provide you some of the motivation, some of the results, and some comparisons with some of our historical d data. Um, as we've done before, this is a Zoom conference, so you will not be able to ask a question using your microphone, but I will work to um, collect comments. If you have questions, if you use the chat feature at the bottom of the screen, if you type in uh, a question at the end of the session, I will um, moderate a question and answer with Ryan uh, asking as many of your questions as I can. Um, and so with that, it is my greatest pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Ryan Woodland. Thanks for that, Tom. Um, I'm going to do my best to live up to that introduction. So bear with me for a moment while I work to switch over the screen. Tom, could you let me know, can you see the screen right now? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. And apologize for this. Give me a moment. Ryan, if, if you want to just start, I will be on my, my, my way. I appreciate that, Tom. Thank you. And, um, oh, wait a second. Um, here we go. How does this look? I'm hopeful now that... That looks great, Ryan. Excellent. Excellent. I can tell you what a stable isotope is, but I can't work a TV. So we are off to a great start tonight. But many thanks to everybody for joining us, and um, thank you, Tom, for that wonderful introduction. So this really is a nice opportunity to, um, to speak with you guys, the public, about this research cruise program. It's an exciting new development here at CBL, and um, it's been a pleasure and honor to work on it while I've uh, been here, along with uh, some, um, pretty much all of my colleagues. And here we go. So tonight's program, uh, I've set this up in three acts. We're going to start with um, Act 1. will just be a brief, very brief introduction to education at CBL, the Chesapeake Biological Lab. And then we're going to jump right into the Patuxent River uh, cruise program, the research cruise program. And I'm going to take a little bit of time describing why it's important that we've structured the cruises the way we have. And when I say cruises, of course, this is, um, these are research cruises. So this is all about the science and the sampling. Um, there's very little, very few deck chairs to be found. And then uh, I'm going to end the talk talking about, uh, we'll give you two short stories, which are really introductions to some of the data we've found and some of the um, interesting results we're starting to see. These are very preliminary. This uh, cruise program is only um, two years have been completed, so it's in its infancy. But already we're starting to see some um, interesting results that I have no doubt we're going to build on. 
So for those of you who haven't been to CBL before, it's a beautiful campus. It's located on the shores of Solomon's Island in uh, at the mouth of the Patuxent River. And you can see here one of the main administrative buildings overlooking the river itself with our research pier right across the street. And then if you look way out in the distance, it looks like the land ends and that's actually the mouth of the Patuxent River. So you can see the lab itself is situated right next to the river and its confluence with Chesapeake Bay. So it's a prime spot to conduct research on um, both river and tributaries. Um, so tributaries in the Chesapeake Bay uh, as well as the bay itself. So as Tom alluded to, the Chesapeake Bay uh, Biological Lab is quite old, 95-year um, history. It was started in 1925 by a gentleman named Reginald Truitt. And Truett was sort of a pioneer for his time. He was very interested in the populations of oysters, blue crabs, uh, rockfish, and striped bass in the Chesapeake Bay. But he recognized the importance of how these animals, these fishery species, interact with their environment and the importance of the environment in terms of ultimately the fisheries production. So he started this uh, laboratory on the shore of Solomon's Island in 1925 and it was a, actually a collaborative effort um, between several different uh, educational institutions. And it was really set up as a facility to support education from the start. I mean, there was obviously a big focus on research, but, but um, just to take a moment to read the bottom part of that uh, placard you see in the photo of, just, of the Chesapeake Biological Lab. One of the uh, goals was to afford a research lab, um, to, I'm sorry, to afford a research and study center where facts teaching to, uh, facts tending toward a fuller appreciation of nature may be gathered and disseminated. And that's the, that education component of dissemination that really, I think, um, set the standard for CBL moving forward. And so almost from the beginning, um, education was an important activity at CBL. There were summer classes for uh, undergraduate students on the shores of the Patuxent River. And through time, the education focus at CBL shifted to more of a graduate level education for students pursuing their masters and their uh, doctoral degrees. But even though the, maybe the, uh, the level of education focus has changed and the techniques have changed through time, certainly this, um, well, as Tom alluded to, this uh, excellence, the standard of excellence for education at CBL has continued since its beginnings. So I would argue that one of the reasons CBL has been as successful as it has been, uh, both in research and education, is because it is located on the shore of the Patuxent River. The Patuxent River, um, you can view it as a, kind of a blessing or a curse, but it suffers from many of the same stressors that the rest of the Chesapeake Bay watershed um, and waters suffer from. And so that makes the Patuxent River a really good model for understanding how the changes that humans are making on the landscape and uh, in the water itself, how those affect the ecosystem. So when I talk about stressors, um, you can think about changes in the watershed. The, as land gets cleared, as we see a transition from forest to agriculture, um, and then eventually even a reforestation and a, re and a growth of, suburbi of suburban areas. So those changes have um, a big influence on what happens in the river system through things like uh, the runoff of nutrients or pollutants into the river. Also population growth. Human population has a massive, it's a massive pressure on estuaries like the Patuxent River and the Chesapeake Bay as a whole. Increased fisheries harvest, as populations grow, there's more demand. And as our ability to transport fresh seafood increases, again, there's an increase in the harvest pressure. Industrialization. Those of you familiar with the Patuxent River might know of the Chalk Point um, Energy Facility that was built in the 70s. And then of course, with all this um, land use change, there's um, large scale changes in shoreline, which uh, are important habitat. So lots of different stressors in the Patuxent River. And these stressors can have a range of, um, sort of negative environmental effects. So we can see, we see declines in water quality over the last century or so. Um, certainly uh, over the last um, decades, 
we see declines in the plants that live in the shallow waters of the Patuxent River. So for example, you see this uh, series of photographs on your screen. On the right in the top, we have 1933. All that dark modeled area, that's um, submerged aquatic vegetation, seagrass. And then by the mid 1900s, you can see how that seagrass has declined. And then in that aerial image from 1999, it's all but gone. Uh, we see similar changes, as I alluded to earlier, in the um, availability of natural shoreline habitat. We see declines in the abundance of fish and shellfish. And also in some species, we see um, increased contaminant levels. So all of those stressors um, eventually lead to um, some negative environmental effects, like some of these I've just mentioned. And again, because of CBL's location, its proximity to the Patuxent River, it really gives us sort of a, an unparalleled opportunity to study the river and try to understand how these stressors act at a very large scale, at almost a system scale, um, to, result, to result in some of these negative effects. And so it's not just changes on the landscape that are affecting the Patuxent River. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention climate change as well. There have been some recent studies uh, by my colleague Dave Secor and his um, uh, research assistant Rebecca Wingate, um, as well as some of my own colleagues uh, on papers that I've, I've worked on, where we've shown an increase in the average temperature of the waters in the Patuxent River, as well as an accumulation of the, um, the thermal energy in the river uh, over time. And so both of those trends are, are pretty clear and they mirror what we're seeing um, in many other systems in the Chesapeake Bay and also in some areas around the world. So now I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, I'm going to get away from the doom and gloom a bit and talk about you know, how we arrived at the current uh, incarnation of the Patuxent River Research Cruise Program. I'm going to talk about why we chose to look at it to structure the cruise the way we did. And um, well, then, that'll, then I'll talk about the actual activities that we get into aboard each of these cruises. So there are two primary goals um, for the Patuxent Research Cruise Program. And as Tom, uh, Tom Miller mentioned at the start of this presentation, he, uh, this was a, a goal and an aspiration of his, and I'm very happy to say that, um, that he helped make it happen. So we definitely appreciate him for that. So the first goal was to develop a long-term monitoring program. And long-term uh, long collections of data are just invaluable for helping us understand and being able to put together the missing pieces in these really complex ecosystems when we try to understand those relationships between stressors and effects. What I think was really interesting and fun about this process was that it wasn't just uh, myself and um, two of my colleagues, Jeremy Testa and Laura Lapham, who were involved in the orchestration and developing this cruise. It was actually the faculty at large. We had a number of meetings, got a lot of input, um, lots of input, particularly from um, some faculty. I'm thinking Laura Harris was particularly helpful and um, had a lot of substantive input. So this really was a collaborative effort, bringing together all these different uh, levels of expertise and areas of ex expertise to try to develop the best uh, research program we could. So the second goal was to develop an educational tool for our students. So the cruises themselves, we envisioned them as providing an opportunity for our graduate students and undergraduates when they visit to develop technical skills, to be able to operate certain pieces of equipment, to become, um, uh, to be able to look at certain types of data, uh, become, you know, and start to understand how the equipment works, the kinds of data they produce and how we might use it. It also gives the students an opportunity to practice leadership aboard, aboard cruises. Uh, for those of you who don't know any scientists, just imagine a herd of cats. I mean, trying to get us to do anything um, instead of like stick our head in our own bucket of goo or water or whatever it is, is really tough. So it really gives those students an opportunity to be chief scientists aboard these cruises, to take that leadership role and develop that, that skill. And then finally, the cruises itself offer a platform for the students to uh, collect their own research data so it can help them directly on their master's thesis or their doctoral research. 
So this is my slide where I attempt to explain why we structured the cruises the way we, we did. And I think that this is a good way to think about it because when we think about the Patuxent River as an ecosystem, as a system of interacting parts, one sort of easy way for me at least to think about it is to think about the environment and then to think about the plants and animals that live in the river. And so I've summarized those in these two little diagrams. We have the environment, which includes the light coming into the river, which um, affects how plants and, micro and the algae grow. We have the nutrient concentrations that provide sort of the food for the algae, uh, the gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide and methane, which are really important for the sort of the health of the ecosystem, but also ultimately for the climate of the planet. We think about things like salinity, uh, how, how salty is the water, uh, how warm, what's the temperature of the water. Um, and then we also um, think about things like biogeochemistry, how the nutrients actually change from one form to another. And um, that has really important implications for how those nutrients are used by the food web. And of course, all those processes, they're not only acting in the water, they're also acting down in the sediment, in the mud and sand at the bottom of the river. So it's important that we sample both um, sort of the composition and the conditions in the water as well as the sediment. And then because I am a fish ecologist, I'm sort of a critter guy at heart, um, so we need to sample, well, we did we determined we want to sample the food web, and this is near and dear to my heart. So the food web, what you're seeing there is a very simple version. Uh, it looks complex, and it is, but it's still a simplification of what's going on. But it's important to understand what's going on with the top predators, the, you know, the rockfish or the bluefish or the summer flounder that we like to catch and eat. It's important to understand what's happening with the other parts of the food web in order to understand why we might see better growth or higher abundance of those predators in one year to the next. So it's important to sample the smaller fish, the, uh, the worms and clams that live down in the mud, um, and even the zooplankton, the small crustaceans and small plants that live in the water. So it's all tightly coupled together. And this trying to understand how these, um, how the environment and the food web interact is the, it's the, it's the model we used to, um, to ultimately decide what sorts of samples to take while we're on the river and uh, what sorts of gears to use. So now I'm going to start talking about the cruise itself, the fun part. So we set up these, the cruise program to go out three times a year. So we focus on the late spring or early summer, the midsummer, and then the early fall. So this really captures a very productive time in the Patuxent River ecosystem. And we specifically chose it so we could capture that early level, that early sort of productive period in the spring, that midsummer period that's very productive, but also we tend to see a lot of poor water quality during the midsummer. And then the late summer, we often see sort of the habitat, the water quality getting a little bit better, uh, but there's still lots of um, production, lots of activity going on. So it seemed like a good time to sample. We chose four stations to sample along the river itself. The uppermost station is near Dunkirk. Again, if you're familiar with the geography of the river, but even if you're not, you can see that figure in the upper right. That's the, uh, what the Patuxent River looks like up in that area. Lots of um, wetlands, uh, very, sort of muddy uh, water, very productive area, lots of animals using it as a nursery, lots of fish using it as a nursery habitat. We had our next station down is near Benedict, uh, near that chalk point um, power generating facility, which you can see in that middle photograph. And then um, there's a station, which I don't have a photo for, but it's near Bruins Island, sort of that third station down. And then finally we have uh, the final station near the mouth of the Patuxent River, right in Solomon's, just offshore of our lab here. So I'm going to run through soup to nuts. What do we sample and sort of how do we do it? And this is going to be brief. So um, I'll try to describe it as best I can in sort of the limited amount of time I have to run through these slides. But this is our vessel that we use for our sampling. This is the uh, research vessel, Rachel Carson, which is um, birthed out of of CBL, out of Solomon's here. There you see the captain, um, Michael Hume, and first mate Rob Nilsson. 
They are instrumental, obviously, in capturing the boat, but also getting all of our gear over the side and making sure none of us fall in the water. The ship itself is a wonderful um, sampling platform. It has a very shallow draft, meaning that uh, the keel doesn't stick down very far into the water, which means we can get up into very shallow water to sample the river um, way up at that upstream station. It also can move very quickly, uh, top speed around 23 knots, and it's a, it's a nice sized vessel. It's uh, about 81 feet overall. So it's a good size. It's got lots of great capability for us um, for this research program. I had to include this uh, slide because invariably, whenever we go out in the river, um, right before we sample, people are stretching out on deck. Um, I couldn't find them, but people, uh, photos of it, but people do yoga on the deck just to limber up. And of course, we have to remain well caffeinated because these are long days. Okay, so when we arrive on station, Typically, the first thing, uh, piece of gear we deploy is the CTD. And so that's that large uh, instrument that you see in the left-hand side of your screen. Um, and that's our uh, research technician, Skylar Galt, who is operating it. So the CTD is a, um, it's a wonderful de device. It lets us uh, monitor things like salinity, dissolved oxygen, temperature, uh, the amount of um, uh, algae in the water, the phytoplankton. Uh, and so it has a bunch of other sensors on it as well. It lets us collect water. Uh, it also has a pump strapped to it so we can pump large volumes of water up on deck for sampling. Uh, we can also monitor uh, the conditions in the water as the CTD goes down from the surface to the bottom. And you see an example of that data on your screen there. So we can monitor those data from inside the ship's wet lab. Uh, and this is important because it tells us where in the water column we might see a change in the saltiness of the water or where we might see a change in the amount of oxygen in the water. And those are often areas where we're really interested in sampling, taking some, um, some specific water quality samples. And then of course we sample the water itself. This is the uh, sampling for the nutrients I spoke about earlier to get a sense for uh, the concentration of nitrogen or phosphorus, carbon, uh, as well as some other gases. After we finish with the water column, it's into the bottom. So we have a few devices that we use to sample the, um, sample the muds and to really sample deep into the mud. The um, device you see on the left, that is a box core. And you see Jeremy Testa and some folks in his lab getting ready to deploy the, uh, the box core here. And so what that does is it's deployed to the bottom and it takes a big sort of squarish chunk out of the bottom. But when you bring it up to the top, it actually holds that piece of uh, sediment intact with the water uh, overlying it. And what that lets them do is collect these smaller cores, which you see in that photo in the middle. And then they can measure the exchange of nutrients from the sediment to the water, as well as changes in oxygen. So it's a very, um, a very useful tool for understanding how those waters are interacting with the sediment. And then on the right, we see a gravity core. Uh, I always think of a torpedo when I see this, except this torpedo is deployed straight down from the surface, right into the mud. And so if you can sort of squint your eyes there at that figure on the right, that picture on the right, you see those ladies with, uh, those are uh, women working with Laura Lapham on one of those cores. So that long tube at the bottom of that yellow uh, gravity core is a big long tube. It's just like the ones in the middle photograph, but it's about three or four feet long. And so that goes, dives into the sediment, collects a big long core for us to do some really high level precision analysis of the muds. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And then uh, sort of the final component of our sampling on station is the food web sampling. So we sample the, uh, the small animals that are living in the mud near the surface. Uh, we use a uh, what's called a ponar grab or just a bottom grab to do that. You can see sort of an example of what they look like in that upper left picture. On uh, the lower left, you see an undergraduate student, an intern actually at mine, Ali Autry. He was sifting out some of the mud so we could put those uh, clams and worms and snails and all the other animals in the grab uh, into a jar for us to analyze back at the lab. In the middle photograph, you see us sampling for the plankton. Uh, Again, plankton is it's, it's very um, central to the way these ecosystems and these food webs work. And I've included, um, and we use, well, I should say, we use um, different types of nets and pumps for this sampling. 
And one um, particular uh, component of the sampling that I'm very interested in, I've shown a picture of them here, mycid shrimp. The, they're a really important prey for lots of different animals, not just in the Tuxedo River, but also uh, in the Chesapeake Bay. So it's animals like this small mycid, as well as copepods, um, phytoplankton, larval fish, a number of different really important animals we catch uh, using those nets. And then on the right, the, it's always the uh, sort of the most chaotic and the funnest part of the cruise, in my mind, is the fish trawl. So in this case, you actually see Tom Miller, the, uh, the director of the lab, helping Skyler and uh, another student measure fish that we capture in the trawl. And the trawl is basically a big net that we put over the, side, over the back of the ship and we drag it along the bottom for about five minutes. And when it comes to the surface, we identify and measure and count uh, every fish or, or blue crab that we catch. So I know that was a bit of a whirlwind uh, introduction to our cruises, but you know, I really wanted to drive home the fact that, you know, whether it's conditions in the water column, whether it's the nutrients and gases in the muds, or the animals that we're sampling um, in the bottom, in the water, or the big predatory fish, we're really trying to capture lots of different indicators and sort of what we believe are the key indicators um, of conditions in this estuary. So, so far we've had two successful years where we've had complete um, cruise schedules. That was 2018 and 2019. Unfortunately, we're, we were not able to come, uh, well, really to have any cruises during 2020 due to COVID-19 restrictions, but we are hopeful to restart the uh, research cruises uh, next year in 2021. So in those two years of uh, cruises so far, we've had 18 different students um, participate. This includes graduate students, uh, undergraduate interns, both uh, NSF funded uh, students as well as community college students. We've had donors and visitors aboard. Uh, and then of course, uh, research assistants and um, faculty. So now I'm going to shift gears and, uh, and move on to act three of my talk today. And I've sort of broken these up by colors because I think that those are good ways to describe each of these little, uh, these little stories. So the first color is green and I'm coloring it green because this is about methane, which is actually a very potent greenhouse gas. Often when we think about greenhouse gases, well, I don't know about you, but I think of carbon dioxide. And it turns out that methane is actually 20, has 25 times the warming potential of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So greenhouse, uh, methane is a very potent greenhouse gas, and it's very important to our Earth's uh, heat budget and heat dynamics. So methane, um, in the river at least, is naturally generated in the sediment, uh, and also sometimes in the water. It's typically formed in the absence of oxygen. So that's why it's often formed down in the sediments where there isn't a lot of oxygen. And sometimes if you have very poor water quality, if you get low oxygen, which we call hypoxia, you can get methane starting to form uh, in the water column as well. And so even though we know that uh, methane is a very potent and important greenhouse gas, we don't know really much about the role of the Patuxent River or estuaries in general in, as a source of methane um, globally. So how they, how they contribute as a source of methane to that global methane budget really is unknown. So this is a brand new area of research and it's very exciting. So we do sample methane on our cruises. Uh, Laura Lapham is a specialist on methane geochemistry. You can see here her on the left. She's precariously balancing that, uh, that long tube from the gravity core. You can see if you look at the tube closely, about half of it is brown, that's the sediment, and about three feet worth of sediment there. And then the upper part, it's a bit streaky, but it's clear water, so you see the core, about three feet worth of sediment taken from the bottom in that particular core. So those cores are then sliced very thinly, and each of those slices is analyzed for um, methane concentration as well as uh, other, other um, gases or nutrients. So we can see how methane, the amount of methane changes as you move down in that core. And then that figure on the right, you, um, we also say, you can see some folks working to collect methane from the water. Uh, that we collect at each station. 
And actually, the gentleman who's hiding his face from us uh, under the hat, that is Drew Hobbs, who's a PhD student at CBL. And he's working with Laura Lapham and I to try to understand methane in the Patuxent River. So I'm actually going to show you some data from, um, from um, that grad student, um, Drew Hobbs. And these data, I just want to take a minute to talk about the figure real quick before I show you the data. So what we're going to be looking at is how the amount of methane and how it changes as you move down the core deeper into the sediment. So at the very top of that figure is going to be sort of the surface of the sediment, right where it meets the water. And then we get deeper as you move down. And then as you go from left to right, you see the amount of methane increases from zero all the way up to about 3,500 micromolar. So as you move to the right in this figure, that's more methane. So if we look at this core from July of 2019, early July of 2019, what you see is kind of what we expect, right? There's very little methane near the surface um, of the sediment because that methane can interact with the water. Often the water has lots of oxygen, and so we don't see a lot of methane formed there. But as you move down into the um, core, very quickly you see lots and lots of methane. And if we look at other cores collected during July, we see a very similar pattern. You know, we see very low values near the surface, and then we see uh, relatively high values kind of as we move down into the core itself. But what's really interesting is when you look when we look at data from September, so all those lines on the right side, the yellow, green, and gray are from July, and then that brownish line on the left is from September. So what we see is there's a big decline in the concentration of methane in the sediment um, two months later. And so what this means is that that methane has moved out of the sediment up into the water column. So we're seeing clear evidence that this methane that's being generated in the sediment because there's no oxygen is, being, is moving up into the water column, being transported upwards. Now we can look then at, well, what's going on in the water column itself? And so again, these are more data that Drew put together for me. And so when we look at this figure now, the way to interpret this is the very top of the figure is the surface of the water, and the very bottom is the, sort of the surface of the sediment, the surface of the mud now. So now again, I'm just focused on the water column itself. And that red line is the concentration of methane. So you see the red line down near the bottom, near the bottom of the figure, is quite high, near 1,000 um, nanomolar. It, that's the concentration. And then as you move sort of up into the water column, that red line shifts to the left. There's less and less methane in the water until you get near the surface and there's quite a bit less. And so if you, this makes a lot of sense if you look at that blue line. That blue line is dissolved oxygen in the water. And if you remember I said that methane forms typically when there's no oxygen present. Well, when there is oxygen present, methane can get recycled and um, sort, of, um, sort of used. And, is taken out of the system. So it's very, and if you look at the pattern, as the oxygen, the blue line, declines from the surface and gets very, very low in the bottom, that's the opposite pattern we see with the methane. So it looks very clear that the conditions in the water column, the amount of oxygen in particular, has a very strong effect on sort of the concentration of methane in the water column at the same time. And if you think about it, this means that the quality of the water can have a really strong influence on how much of this greenhouse gas gets out to the atmosphere. In fact, if we just think about how much methane was actually measured in the surface water for each of these cruises, it's pretty remarkable. So what this figure is here, each of those blue lines is a measurement of methane concentration, so how much methane there was, at the very surface of the water, within about a foot and a half of the surface. And if we compare those concentrations, and so I should say each line is for each cruise, and if we compare those concentrations to the concentration of methane in the atmosphere, that's that little green line right at the bottom of that figure, we see a huge amount of methane in the water compared to the atmosphere. If you look at the um, sort of the lowest concentration we measured during the cruises, 
about 700% of the atmospheric concentration. If you look at the highest uh, level we measured, it's about 26,000% of the atmospheric concentration. And the way gases work is when there's a high concentration right next to an area with a low concentration, those gases will, will flow from the high concentration to the low concentration. So this really suggests that the Patuxent River, probably many rivers in the Chesapeake Bay area are sources of methane to the atmosphere. And that graduate student, Drew, um, that I mentioned earlier, he's gonna be working on trying to understand what the, you know, what the mechanisms are that control the formation and ultimately perhaps the flux of this methane to the atmosphere. So my final story uh, for this talk is uh, the color, it's based on the color blue. So this is blue catfish. Uh, blue catfish are a really interesting uh, species in this area because they're not native, they're an invasive species. They were introduced in two rivers in Virginia in 1974 actually. Um, and since that time, they've spread throughout the Chesapeake Bay. Now they spread because some people have deliberately um, released them in some rivers in order to try to build a, a fish for sport fishing. But they've also, they're tolerant. They can live in slightly salty water. So in some years, they're able to swim out to the main stem of Chesapeake Bay and actually swim up to other rivers. And so through those two mechanisms, they've been able to invade many rivers in the, in the Chesapeake Bay system. And it's unknown what effect these, um, this invasive species will have on the food web and the ecosystem of the Patuxent River. So just as a quick aside, the blue catfish isn't the only invasive uh, catfish in the Patuxent River. We also have flathead catfish, uh, and they're not considered invasive, but the channel catfish in the lower left of that figure, it's not native. It is, was introduced um, quite a while ago to native of the Missouri River drainage and um, sort of the western, the midwestern U.S. Um, the only native catfish species we have in the Patuxent River is the white catfish in the lower right. So, you know, talking about the blue catfish and its um, history of invasion, it's actually a very recent invader of the Patuxent River. That figure you see on the left with the orange and the white lines those are the counts of catfish caught in 2004 when a survey by Tom Miller here at CBL went out to the Patuxent and they sampled up and down the river for all different kinds of fish uh, each month of the year. And you can see they caught a number of channel catfish and they caught a few white catfish, but not a single blue catfish. And that was in 2004. That figure in the upper right that you see those are data from a different study uh, out of the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And what they're showing is sort of a map. Uh, the, left, the map on the left is from 1996 to 2002, with those black dots showing you know, observed blue catfish. And you see it in a number of river systems, but inside that lavender or pinkish box that I've drawn, you don't see any black dots in that first map. It's not until that second uh, map on the right from 2003 to, I believe it's 2008, it's actually hidden on my screen, but you can see there start to be a few black dots, a few observations. So really the blue catfish, this invasion story only started about 20 years ago in the Patuxent River. And in terms of um, ecological time, that's, that's very recent. What's really intriguing about that is that blue catfish dominated our uh, fish trawls in the upper part of the Patuxent River. And so even though they're a recent invader and even though they weren't seen at all in 2004, here about 15 years later, they were um, by far the most abundant fish in the trawl in those, um, those freshwater stations and also had the most mass, the most biomass, most weight. And I wanted to show you this picture because it's really interesting. If you look at that tote, that sort of figure, that, uh, sorry, that picture, photograph in the middle of your screen, you can make out, well, if, you're, if, you're, if you know your fish, you can make out some catfish, shaped fish there in the tote. But what's really important about this is if you look closely, all those small fish you see are juvenile, just spawned and just growing blue catfish. 
And we caught literally thousands of these in several uh, toes in the Patuxent River. The why that's particularly important is that uh, there's other uh, surveys that go out and monitor the Patuxent River. So there's one that goes out and uses a net from shore to sample the fish in the Patuxent and other rivers. And they hadn't seen more than a hand, they hadn't seen any young blue catfish in the Patuxent River up until last year. I think they caught just a handful. So it's very clear that our monitoring survey is going to provide a lot of really needed uh, information when we start to think about um, how many of these blue catfish might be out there and how they might be reproducing in the Patuxent River. And it's not just the juveniles that we saw on the cruise either. Using our net, we saw a number of uh, sort of what I might call medium-sized blue catfish that figure in the middle, I'm sorry, that uh, picture in the middle, being held by um, uh, Brittany, a, uh, a student and intern. And then we also see, uh, we caught a number of larger catfish, uh, blue catfish. As you see, Skylar, again, the technician holding there on the right. So what we're seeing is evidence of a very large population and a very robust sort of age and size structure. The reason this is so important is because blue catfish are like living vacuum cleaners. They will eat anything that they can catch. And so when they're quite small, they'll eat invertebrates, small worms, um, very small fish. Uh, but then as they get bigger, they start to graduate to larger foods. So uh, bigger clams uh, and even fish that we um, fish for ourselves in, in human fisheries for. So white perch, pumpkin seeds. And there's concerns in a number of rivers that blue catfish might be an important predator of shads, different species of shad. So there's a real uh, potential for these invasive, this invasive catfish to alter the ecosystem, the food web in the Patuxent River. And just um, as a closing note, even though we only have a handful of sites where we sample for fish in the upper Patuxent River, there's data from other studies like you see in that map on the right that really show that blue catfish are pervasive throughout the upper Patuxent River. So this is certainly an ecosystem level problem that I'm hopeful our crews, our research program can eventually shed some light on. So with that, I'd like to end. Uh, thank everybody for tuning in and listening. And I'll be happy to answer questions, which I believe Tom is going to moderate. So I am going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I looked up at one point and saw someone kneeling by a tote, and I thought, who's that old man? And I looked at a second time, and it was me. Um, <laughs> so uh, we are as young as we feel, not as old as we look. So questions are beginning to come in. So the first question, um, a gentleman just used, or person just used their initials, BKG. Are snakeheads observed in the Patuxent? And are they an issue? They are observed in the Patuxent River, and they certainly uh, pose a similar threat to as the blue catfish in terms of being an important top predator. Unfortunately, uh, well, I guess depending on how you look at it, we didn't encounter any snakeheads in our sampling. It's possible that we're too far downstream. Um, it's also possible that because we're sampling in the middle of the channel, um, we're not sampling in the right habitat to actually capture snakeheads. So yes, um, I believe they pose certainly a threat to the system, but unfortunately I don't think our program is the best um, to address that problem. Uh, BKG was Brian from Horn Point, so thank, thank you, Brian. Uh, from Victoria Jones, who um, evidently used to spend her childhood on the river, um, she said, what's the ideal salinity in the river in the areas that you study? Is it more fresh, brackish, or salty? That's a very good question. And it's one that I meant to address as I was describing our different stations that we chose. Unfortunately, I forgot to, so I'm glad you asked that question. We chose the stations we did specifically so we could sample in areas that were fresh, but still influenced by the tides. And then our stations go from that freshwater station down um, and just get progressively saltier until at that lowermost station near the mouth, salinities can reach about, well, at the most, usually 15 parts per thousand, although often it's a little bit lower, around 12. 
All right. So uh, Victoria then followed up with a question about the methane. And she said, when methane increases in the sediment of the river, is anaerobic bacteria part of its increase? Anaerobic bacteria are, so this is getting into an area that's beyond my level of expertise, but I will do the best to answer your question without making anything up. So anaerobic bacteria are the, um, the mechanism for, or at least one of the mechanisms for creating the methane in the sediment. As to what conditions, and I would suspect that in, anaer in anaerobic conditions, there probably are more of those uh, bacteria, but I don't know that. And um, I'd be happy to find out the answer for you. If you want to provide an email, I can get back to you with a, a better answer, either from Drew or from Laura Lapp. Victoria, if you email me, uh, miller at umseas.edu with your question, I'll make sure we get you a definitive uh, answer. Um, so uh, Ron Satula says, how can community residents participate to help with the research? That is a really good question. And it's not one that we've directly explored yet. Um, there are citizen science uh, research groups. I know of one out of uh, the Pearl Lab uh, and also now Jefferson Patterson Park on Kentucky. They, um, a gentleman named uh, well, uh, Dr. Tom Ivey, is in charge of a citizen science um, monitoring program that goes out and samples fish and small invertebrates using traps in different parts of the bay. So. There are efforts like that to help uh, inform the science of the Patuxent River. But at the moment, we don't have a mechanism for that with the Patuxent River cruises, although that's a really interesting idea. It might be one that we could develop in the future. Um, and uh, Ron follows up with our visitors allowed on, on the boat. Um, I'll take this one and say, sadly, um, we can't take visitors on the boats. We do take undergraduate students who are doing interns with us. And we have taken our docents out um, um, when we've done docent training with them as part of that experience. Um, but Ron, if you're interested, please, please contact me. Um, Ted Turner asks uh, a challenging question. So it says, for years, the UMSI's report card on the bay has shown the Patuxent River with a grade of D minus. What are the key contributors to that rating, and what can be changed to make it better? Well, I would, I don't know specifically about the, the individual sort of issues that led to that, um, to that grading specific, but I do know that eutrophication is a key stressor for the Patuxent River, and I suspect that that is a key reason why the Patuxent River gets a low grade year after year. And so that's due to nutrient inputs into the Patuxent River. Uh, nitrogen in particular, phosphorus is, uh, is important as well. And what we see is we see um, annual blooms of phytoplankton that bloom because there's lots of those nutrients in the water, those phytoplankton sink and uh, accumulate in certain areas of the river particularly deep um, sort of depositional areas, and that leads to hypoxia. And so it's that I would suspect that one of the main reasons that we're consistently graded so low is due to that sort of persistent hypoxia that comes back year after year. And again, that's linked to nutrient inputs, which are tied to sort of the characteristics of the watershed, septic inputs from, um, from residences along the rivers, as well as nutrient inputs from wastewater treatment. So um, some more blue catfish questions. Um, so Claire Newbert asks, any evidence of blue catfish eating oyster larvae and spat? I don't know of any directly. Um, I, I don't know of any directly. I will say that my understanding of blue catfish growth ecology is that they are typically not feeding off of hard structures, uh, at least not being attached bivalves like oysters off of hard structures. They're, um, 
to be browsing through the mud um, and catching animals moving on or just above the mud surface. That's not to say that they're not that they're not capable of it. Um, it's an interesting question, but not one that I have any direct knowledge. Of. Okay, staying on blue catfish with my favorite junior STEM uh, scientist, uh, Freya, who Freya Rains, who says. Do blue catfish prefer water that has more or less salt in it? So do they occur in fresher water or more salty water? So blue catfish seem to prefer fresh water, without a doubt. But they are capable of tolerating slightly salty water. And there's been some really nice research out of the Virginia Institute of Marine Science looking at how salty they can tolerate. And it seems that as the blue catfish grow and get older and larger, they're able to tolerate higher levels of salt for longer. And so that's one of the mechanisms that we think that's allowed these larger catfish to move into the main stem of the bay during really wet years because the salinity has gotten low enough and those bigger fish are able to tolerate the saltiness. And that's what's let them, in many cases, move up the bay to these other river systems. All right, thank you, Ryan. Um, there are two people who share a love with me of one of my favorite fish. Um, so Edward Engel and Mike Lawson both ask about eels. Uh, Mike in particular notes that when he was a kid, there were a number of eels in the river, but there don't seem to be any now. What are your findings in your samples? So we are catching eels occasionally in the trawl. Um, again, similar to the uh, snakehead, our, though our use of the trawl isn't the best gear to sample eels. Um, eels are much more effectively sampled in pots and other trap type structures because eels tend to, as I'm sure, as I'm sure you guys know, the eel fans, they really tend to congregate and look in those structured areas looking for a place to hide. And so, you know, if we were sampling, if we were putting out cages or pots, and checking those pots so repeatedly, that be a, that'd give us a much better idea of sort of the number of eels in the Patuxent River. But unfortunately, that's a bit beyond our, our sample. Thank you, Ryan. We'll ask um, one last question, uh, and then we'll allow everyone to go. So um, Kezios uh, um, asks, with sea level rise and, um, with er and erosion, are the sediment layers building up in the river, and is this impacting methane levels? That's a great question. So I'll answer the first part of your question. Certainly, um, sediment accumulation in the Patuxent River uh, is occurring, and it's occurring not just in the Patuxent River, but sort of broadly throughout the Chesapeake Bay more rapidly than certainly it would have prior to uh, European development, just because of that increased erosion that you mentioned in your question. As to how the rate of deposition influences methane dynamics, I do not have a good answer for you. I will, you know, I'll sort of reference the fact that, you know, as the muds accumulate, there is there can be very little oxygen in those muds due to all the uh, sort of all the respiration by bacteria uh, in the mud near the surface of the mud, uh, as well as the water column. And so, with more sort of porous mud available, there is probably going to be a deeper depth at which methane might be able to form and work its way into the water column. But in terms of the specifics. Again, I'd have to get in touch with uh, over Laura Lapham to give you probably the answer you want. All right, Ryan, I've got one last question for, for you, but um, I want to thank all of our uh, atten attendees. Um, I want to remind all of them that, uh, first of all, this seminar and all of the other seminars that we've given as part of the Science for Citizens are available on our website. If you go to www.umces.edu and just put science for citizens in the search box, you'll find them. Um, and we certainly encourage you to share all of them. And um, 
The last question is from a person whose name you'll know. It's from Erin Riley. And she says, what's your favorite memory from one of these cruises? So my favorite memory from one of these cruises. That is a good question. It would probably be, probably be when we actually, I think it would have to be when we were racing home from one of the upstream stations trying to feed out a lightning storm. And I almost included it in some of the photos, but somebody took a great photo through the wet lab window of the ship. You can see a bolt of lightning going from the sky to the ground. It was a bit of a white knuckle cruise, but it was probably the most exciting memory from the cruises for me. And there I thought you were going to say seeing me on my hands and knees dug, digging through a net full of blue catfish. Um, so um, uh, I really appreciate your time tonight, uh, Ryan. Thank you very much for this. Thank you all for attending. A reminder that we will be back next Tuesday when Jeremy Tester will be looking at decades of change in the Patuxent River from a more biogeochemical viewpoint, looking at some of the changes in the process rates um, around the Patuxent R River that are, it really is a reflection of CBL's commitment to understanding our local environment, understanding the bay, and, and helping um, to, to lead to a more sustainable future. So um, I appreciate all of you joining us. Ryan, thank you once again for a wonderful seminar, and we'll see you all next week. Thank you all. Thank you.